Welcome back. This is Alfred Weber, and we're with um, Kevin Annett, who is uh, the director of the International Tribunal into the Crimes of Church and State. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Alfred. Uh, well, it's been quite an exciting uh, week for you. As I understand it, you were um, uh, in the U.K. or about to go into the U.K., and, and you were, uh, were commanded to leave, to leave the U.K. Uh, and I wondered if you could tell us uh, a bit about what occurred to you sure. uh, over the past week. Well, what happened was in early May, I went into England um, and to help organize events leading up to the tribunal against uh, primarily the Catholic Church, but also we've named the Crown of England as an actor in, in genocide. And I left, after a few weeks, I went to the Netherlands to receive the endorsement of a, a federation there of indigenous nations in Europe. And after getting that endorsement for our tribunal, I tried re-entering England at Stansted Airport uh, on the evening of May 29th. I was detained there for 12 hours, photographed, fingerprinted, held in a prison, and eventually deported without being able to return into England. The only reason they gave for the, me uh, for that happening was they said that they considered it unusual for a, tu a visitor or a tourist to England to be giving lectures, which I found quite odd. Uh, you know, I said, what, people never give talks when they come to England? And um, apparently because I didn't have a work permit, uh, even though I wasn't making money off these lectures, they suddenly said I needed a work permit. And on that basis, I was simply deported. Um, so it was very odd, and, and I was on the verge of giving a... a a speech at a public gathering in Trafalgar Square on June 4th. I was to be one of the main speakers at a rally against uh, child abuse, which was going to discuss the involvement, apparently, of government uh, officials in, in pedophilia and, and child trafficking in England. So I don't think that's an accident that, you know, I was stopped from speaking at that rally or that, you know, they, they're considering this tribunal obviously some kind of threat. Right. And... and and so you think that that there was a connection between your being uh, deported from from England and and uh, the fact that the tribunals are to be convened uh, in September of this year. Very much. I mean, I'm being very active and outspoken in England. Um, and and what was kind of the tip off for me is when I was standing there in front of the the border agency, the guy looked quite uh, uh, unconcerned until he looked at his, he ran my passport through the, his machine and he looked on the computer screen. He looked alarmed, then cut, he went and spoke to his supervisor and immediately after that came back and put me through the ringer. So, I mean, obviously there was something on the computer screen that had alerted him uh, uh, to me. Now, now uh, what do you suppose uh, would be going on in the UK, and what sort of authority uh, could issue such a an order? Uh, I mean, it, it, this seems like it's something that's fairly drastic. Well, don't forget, um, for the last little while, we have been discussing all over the Internet and, and in public meetings how um, we had an eyewitness, William Coombs, who claimed to have seen Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip take 10 children from a Catholic residential school in Kamloops in 1964, and these 10 children were never seen again. Uh, William died subsequently. Uh, he was going to come to England and give that testimony in September, and he died suddenly in a Vancouver hospital in, um, just a couple of months ago. And, you know, so I was talking about that. We were definitely naming the Crown of England as an actor in genocide, as, as the body that's responsible ultimately, along with the Vatican, for the deaths of, of tens of thousands of children in Indian boarding schools in Canada. So, you know, the fact that the Queen herself might be implicated in these things, I think, is no small uh, issue in their mind, at least. And the fact that I was talking about it all over Europe, I'm sure, alarmed them. Well, now, I'm, I'm looking at your website here. It's itccs.org. And, um, and you, you state there that... that Tribunals are to be convened in London, Dublin, Brussels, and Rome on September 15, 2011. So, uh, it seems like you've expanded your your operations since since 
since we last spoke. It's expended a lot, Alfred, and in fact, that's another reason why I think that the, the authorities are beginning to turn the screws on us a little bit. Um, the, what we've decided to do is, on the basis of the, all the support we're getting here, we realize that we need to hold uh, a number of different uh, events at the same time. Um, we chose Brussels, of course, because that's near the Europe, that's the headquarters of the European Union and the Euro European Parliament, which we've asked to come and, and uh, observe and, and assist in our proceedings. Uh, the European Parliament has told us that a number of MPs there have said that they would be willing to entertain a motion to have Canada investigated for genocide. Um, we're going to London and Rome for obvious reasons, and Dublin because there's a big movement there of survivors that want to very much be part of what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, we've, we're also be, uh, we'll be holding gatherings across Canada in Vancouver and Toronto and, and Ottawa to coincide uh, with, with, the, with the tribunal, where we're basically going to be gathering the evidence uh, summoning the various uh, people, including Pope Joseph Ratzinger and the Queen, to come and answer these charges, and eventually issue a report which has a lot of the evidence, um, you know, of the crimes we're speaking of. Right, right. Uh, now, uh, you also mentioned uh, that that there's going to be uh, tri tribunals in Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, New York City, Mexico City, and Australia, but those will be in the future, or is that... Well, it's going to have be commencing, hopefully, uh, oh. again, September 15th. And what, oh, I see. What's going on is, uh, as people can see, by looking at the website, uh, itccs.org, is um, that there's basically going to be an initial six-week period running up to the end of October where we're going to be conducting the, the, this tribunal, going to various places in Europe. Uh, because just like in Canada, there's sites all around Europe where there are mass graves near uh, especially Catholic institutions where a lot of children died. Uh, you know, prime example being near the Magdalen Laundries and Catholic orphanages in Ireland. And so we're going to be conducting, as we'll be doing in Canada, uh, forensic studies and digs at these places to obtain the evidence that children were deliberately killed in these institutions. Um, and on October 30th and 31st, there's going to be a general gathering in Rome outside the Vatican where uh, groups of us are going to be conducting services. I'm going to be conducting like a third and final uh, symbolic exorcism outside the Vatican then. And uh, we're going to be hoping that there will be a European media will be covering this in a big way. We've already had an indication that European uh, uh, television networks uh, will be broadcasting what we're doing since they've already broadcast to over 10 million people uh, our film on repentance about genocide in Canadian boarding schools. So, you know, we're very hopeful that that six-week period is really going to engender a lot of uh, results and and uh, certainly a response by the church and the government that are being named. Um, one of the items here uh, says as follows, Pope Joseph Ratzinger and Queen Elizabeth Windsor have both been issued a public summons by the ITCCS to appear before it in September of 2011 and answer charges of their complicity in crimes against humanity, gen crimes against humanity, genocide, and child trafficking. Could you go into uh, some of the details, uh, both as to Pope Joseph Ratzinger and as to Queen Elizabeth Windsor? I know that we had one of the charges just talked about, mm -hmm. uh, but at, at least so that our, our, our audience gets an idea of the scale of crimes that we're talking about here? Well, you know, starting just in terms of the, the Indian boarding school experience in Canada and the United States, uh, these schools were founded on similar uh, institutions all over the world, but in a general sense, we're talking about the deaths of over 50,000 children authorized by the Crown of England and the Vatican working together. Um, we also are naming the fact that the Pope himself is personally implicated in uh, protecting child rapists within the church and implementing a policy that he helped construct which silences um, anybody who's been harmed by, by a priest, which in effect is a criminal conspiracy to keep the torture and abuse of children uh, a secret uh, and, and uh, uh, to avoid prosecution. So he's personally implicated in that. Uh, the Queen of England, of course, is the head of state in Canada and the head of the Church of England is directly responsible in a fiduciary sense for, for a lot of these crimes. And these crimes range from everything from outright homicide 
to policies of ethnic cleansing, uh, sterilization programs that operated in the Indian boarding schools and at other facilities around the world, all of these given sanction by the Crown of England through laws brought in under her name and her predecessors. So, I mean, it's a direct responsibility for, for really mass murder, uh, medical experimentation, slave labor, and a system of child trafficking and child labor, which, uh, you know, it, in the case of the Magdalene Laundries, continued right up to 1996 and didn't occur just in Ireland. The Magdalene Laundries operated in 35 countries, including Canada. Um, I just got a call the other day from somebody who was in one of these facilities in Canada. And this is where women, young women, when they were got pregnant uh, and weren't married, their children were taken from them, and they were put into situations of forced labor for decades, most of their life in many cases. So the Vatican has made millions, of, if not billions of dollars of the labor of these children. And, um, you know, it not only do they be, need to be held accountable in the criminal sense and prosecuted, but a lot of that wealth, all that wealth that they made off um, these children has got to be returned and compensated in a serious way. Um, now, they, there, have all, uh, there, there, there have already been reports of mass graves and of the remains of children that have not been found uh, here in Canada this, despite the fact uh, that there is an official Canadian, an official uh, Aboriginal commission that is looking into this, uh, how will this tribunal deal with these issues? Well, frankly, Alfred, the, one of the motivating forces in setting up the ITCCS was in response to the clear whitewash being done by the government's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The mandate of the TRC, which you can read at trc.ca in Section 2, it's clearly not an investigative body. They're not allowed to take down uh, evidence when it names names, when it talks about crimes. They're no, in no position to prosecute the churches, um, and they do not even address the issue of the deaths that occurred in the grave sites in the residential schools. They talk around the issue, but they don't actually have the power to lay criminal charges or even subpoena documents. There's nothing the TRC does which compels the churches to cooperate. And so it's not a real investigation in any, by any stretch of the imagination. It, 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 it's designed pretty much to create an appearance um, of an investigation while protecting the perpetrators and pretty much silencing the witnesses. Um, and, and that's pretty clear from what's going on. So what we need to do in Canada is what we've already started to do. We've identified 28 mass grave sites, mostly in Western Canada and your former residential schools. We have local... Um, elders in five different indigenous nations standing by ready to uh, authorize digs on their on their land. And um, we already have the written authorization from two of those nations. So we're prepared to go in. We've already been invited in to come and, and conduct those forensic uh, digs and uh, help the elders return the remains of these children for a proper burial. So that will be happening over the next period. And frankly, when that happens, it's going to open up this entire issue again and make the, can uh, the Canadian government and its churches clear, uh, you know, it'll be clear that they're actors in genocide, not only in the crime, but in the cover-up that's been going on. Right. Now, uh, you, the, this, this tribunal uh, you mentioned has the endorsement of uh, 30, over 30 organizations, mm -hmm. including eight indigenous nations in North America and Asia, as well as survivors of the Catholic Church, Torture in Ireland, Australia, and England, and the Autonomous Sovereign Nation of Eurostatus. Um, could you perhaps talk about some of the organizations that um, have endorsed and support the work of the ITCCS? Yes, I can, I can mention the ones that have, have given their approval to be named sure. publicly at this point. Um, one right here on the West Coast, uh, Chief Capilano of the Squamish Nation, uh, several years ago, he was actually the first hereditary elder in Canada to endorse the tribunal, the idea of an independent international inquiry into genocide in Canada. Um, and he has traditional sovereign jurisdiction over the entire area embracing all of Vancouver. In fact, Capilano issued an eviction order to the Catholic, Anglican, and United Churches in Vancouver, over 300 churches telling them to get off his land because of their refusal to return the remains of the children who had died in the residential schools. So he really...
was uh, an inspiration to others. There was uh, uh, Chief Peter Yellowquill of the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe Nation in, in Manitoba, and some of the Mohawk Confederacies in Eastern Canada have all endorsed the um, this investigation and the the, the allowing the the tribunal to come onto their territory and, and conduct uh, forensics and other investigations. We have the support of um, uh, survivors groups in Ireland, especially uh, three different survivors organizations: uh, Religious Abuse Truth and um, uh, Temple More Forgotten Victims. There's uh, these are all survivors of, of uh, tortures in Catholic. Um, boarding schools there. Also, Eurostate, which is a, a, a federation of indigenous nations in Europe comprising indigenous peoples, such as the Sami the, uh, of, of Finland, the, uh, the Celtic people, the Basques in Spain, they've all endorsed the um, what they see as not only um, a support of other native people, but a way to reassert the sovereign identity of those different nations, recognizing that the only reason these crimes could happen is because of uh, you know false jurisdictions that have been imposed on on these traditional nations. So um, that's and also you know to give you another example, there's uh, uh, some of the indigenous groups in Asia, including the Aka people of Thailand, have also endorsed what we're doing. We work with uh, the Aka Heritage Foundation, which uh, helps fight uh, the child trafficking in Thailand, which is exploiting primarily the Aka native children. We've documented the pedophile, the child trafficking networks between Thailand and Vancouver and the west coast of America, which involved actually some from modern-day church groups that are running the equivalent of board Indian residential schools in Thailand now. So, I mean, this shows you how this is an international network, and we hope to bring all of these issues to the fore when we start holding our, our tribunal events. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm i also looking here at, at the, at the um, uh, events which will... Uh, Happen. You're calling it a second reformation, uh, and that is starting on Sunday, October 30th, outside of uh, uh, the Vatican. Uh, and perhaps you could talk more about that. What what its purpose is, and uh, what you hope it will lead to. Well, very, you know, kind of in a, in a very basic sense, Alfred, we realize that this is not just about uh, a legal process or even a political movement, which it is, but it's also uh, a, a spiritual battle, and, and we look to spiritual transformation. Um, we're dealing with an institution which historically uh, has violated and destroyed its, uh, its the foundational teachings of Christianity. Uh, and so we hope to appeal to Christians and Catholics to say it's time to not simply uh, reform, but overturn these institutions and start again. Uh, a clear example of that is, in, which is also mentioned that in the posting on the on the website, ITCCS website, is we've discovered through our research that the Vatican has secret agreements with over 73 nations in the world, siphoning off billions of dollars of tax money every year to the Vatican. Um, to, to the Vatican Bank. And to give you an example, uh, one, one example that we've documented is in Spain alone in 2010, 262 million euros were given to the Vatican, either directly or by subsidizing Catholic charities and businesses. So we're talking over a third of a billion dollars from one country alone, taken from people's tax money and just simply handed to what really amounts to a criminal organization. And so the only way that can change is if people within those churches take them back and say, we don't want these church bodies to um, to do these crimes anymore. We don't think that Christian churches should be big corporations that exploit and, and destroy children's lives and then get away with it under the law. We want that the churches to be brought under uh, not only a legal system where, where the church is accountable and priests are accountable for their crimes, but in, in a basic sense, we want to see these churches return to their, their basic spiritual roots. And that's part of the appeal we're making to, to Christians everywhere to, to start doing that because they're the only ones who can make this happen. What what sort of a what sort of a future do you see for institutions like like the Catholic Church? Well, I don't really see much of a future for it, frankly, because uh, you know the discontent you see everywhere. Uh, one example is in Austria alone last year, thirty-eight thousand people left the Roman Catholic Church, which was which was a two hundred percent increase over a decade before. 
there's disenchantment everywhere, and as people are completely uh, alienated from these these false churches, and so I think um, we are seeing a decay and destruction of uh, you know the, these institutions that that are really responsible for when you look at it even numerically the gr- greatest crimes in in, in human history, uh, beginning with the destruction of indi- millions of indigenous people all over the world in the name of Christ. So. Fortunately, I, a trend I see happening, including in the Catholic Church, is people are localizing their religions. I know, for example, of Catholic priests in Quebec who recently have left, uh, cut off ties with the Vatican, and simply said that their congregations will operate as independent Catholic churches without any ties to Rome. So, you know, the reason we call it a Second Reformation is we're seeing, again, what happened during the 16th century, uh, you know, begun by Martin Luther, but many others, simply saying, we are not part of Rome anymore. We are establishing our own congregations uh, to follow the teachings of Christ, and we're not going to be part of these big corporate entities, which are really um, betraying, uh, you know, the, the calling of Christians and bet- betraying their basic faith. So, this is really part of the uh, a, a whole global transformation I see going on. Right. Um, uh, Perhaps on a on a even a tougher note, what what do you see as the future specifically of the of Queen Elizabeth Windsor and the Windsor monarchy in in uh, the UK? Well, I think they're in a pretty desperate state themselves, Alfred. Uh, even uh, the most recent poll in Canada about two years ago showed that, you know, despite all the the uh, hoopla over the coming visit of uh, Prince Andrew and Princess uh, Kate. Um, to Canada, uh, over 62% of Canadians are in favor of uh, uh, dissolving all ties to the monarchy and becoming a republic. I mean, that's nearly two-thirds of Canadians want a republic. And in England as well, we have about 45% of Britons who are quite disenchanted with the monarchy. I think that's one of the reasons that Kate and Andrew are coming to Canada. They, they Kate, and, Kate and William. Uh, Kate and William, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, they're coming to Canada to put a new kind of face on the monarchy. Um, th- there's a lot. When I was in England, there was a lot of uh, kind of uh, fun being poked at uh, Charles and Camilla all the time. I mean, a- as you know, kind of the attitude is they're the ones who are going to inherit the throne. You know, we need a, a sexier image. We need s- some younger people who are more in touch with with things going on in the world. That's definitely the motivation, and it's an act of desperation because they know how alienated the monarchy is from even people in England who are traditionally supporters of it. So. Um, you know, I, I think these are all signs of, of really fundamental changes happening. Well, he, he, here we have a, a monarchy that is owned uh, uh, by, I mean, very, very well documented sources. The new book that came out on uh, ownership of the world's land, and it is the world's largest land, and it owns 26% of the surface land on the planet, mm-hmm. and is uh, one of the largest owners of uranium resources right. on the planet. Um, uranium resources are, are essentially this, through nuclear power plants and depleted uranium weapons are essentially destroying the genome of, of all living things and the ecology of the planet. And that's traced directly to the ownership of the Windsor. That's right, and and you know we're talking the, the you know the fiction called the crown, the crown land in England in in Canada is is simply the theft of the land not only from Indigenous people but all Canadians, and to give you an example of what you're talking about, Camco, it's the largest uranium company in the world, based in Saskatchewan, um, it has uh, large shares controlled by top people in the Liberal Party like Bob Ray, um, and the uh, the power corporation that he married into, the Demeray family, have direct ties to Marie Strong and, and the monarchy of England. They're profiting, as you mentioned, off depleted uranium, the destruction of native communities all over northern Saskatchewan by uranium uh, tailings that they dump on native land. The, the cancer rate in northern Saskatchewan is about 200 times the national average because of these actions. And this is a war at home that's being conducted, again, because of the complicity of the Crown of England. And it's time that Canadians say, okay, we're going to take back our land, we're disavowing the so-called, you know, right of the crown to own this land, and we need to simply do what Native people are doing and saying, enough is enough, we're going to take back our country. Now, are 
some of these issues regarding uranium mining and the export of the illegal export of Canadian uranium to uh, U.S., U.K., and Israeli depleted uranium weapons, and the large latifundium and other genocidal issues of the British monarchy, are these going to be on the on the uh, agenda or on the plate of the of, of the tribunal? Very much. Uh, one of the uh, subjects at the tribunal will be uh, uh, ecocide and environmental racism. And we actually welcome people who have that knowledge and, and, and data to present a, uh, uh, make a presentation on these issues at any of the local forums of the tribunal that we held in Canada. So if you or others would like to do that at the Vancouver forums that will be operating in September, then that would definitely be entered into the permanent record of the tribunal. And that's, in fact, one of the issues we really want to emphasize, how the attacks on Mother Earth and on Native people and on children are all linked. And uh, we're trying to show that connection. So, yeah, very much we, we need that uh, expertise and, and input from people. Now, how is it that, that you're getting word of the tribunal out to both the Native community but also now with this expanded mandate uh, out to the broader... Uh, aware, progressive community that is concerned about these issues so that they can participate also? Well, we're, we're doing it um, through our traditional methods, which is through grassroots means, uh, through the Internet, uh, programs like yours. We've inc faced increasing opposition from the corporate media, of course. Uh, they, there was a complete refusal by any of the main media networks to pick this up. We do have um, some agencies like Al Jazeera and some... And, an agency in, in Latin America, which are regularly reporting what we're doing. But we're pretty much shut out of the mainstream media all over the place. So we really rely on your listeners and others to look at our websites and start disseminating the information. Um, again, it's itccs.org. Hiddenfromhistory.org is my main website. And people can contact me. Uh, unfortunately, my main email site was taken down uh, and is being destroyed the day after I got back to Canada. But you can reach me directly at hiddenfromhistory1, like the number one, hiddenfromhistory1 at gmail.com. So, so this seems to be a fairly major, not only cyber attack against the tribunal, but by, I would say, deporting you without cause and hence violating international your rights under the UN Charter of Human Rights and certainly uh, uh, international law because there was no cause, no just cause no. to to ban you. Uh, it seems like uh, um, the the uh, uh, the whatever power is behind this which seems to go directly to the Windsors and to their complex in the city of London to MI6 mm -hmm. and uh, to that entire uh, negative uh, uh, power structure there seems to be fairly, you know, they're they're concerned about this. Oh, very much, Alfred. I mean, it's it's pretty clear this is an increased attack aimed at me directly. Um, after I got back to Canada, I wrote to Jack Layton, the head of the NDP, and Jean Crowder, the uh, local NDP member of Parliament here in Nanaimo. And I asked them directly, I said, I would like you to write to the Foreign Office, uh, I'm sorry, the Home Secretary in England, Theresa May, and object to what happened to me, because this is an attack against a Commonwealth citizen. And I haven't heard back, it's been over a week, and I haven't heard back from Jack Layton at all. Uh, of course, he takes a, he and every other member of Parliament of Canada have taken a personal oath of allegiance to the Crown. So I don't expect him to be, you know, intervening on this issue. But he's also, I understand, an active member of the United Church of Canada. But um, nevertheless, we can use this as a means to, to show that the mainstream political parties and institutions are all part of the problem here. We have to build this as a grassroots citizens' movement, and we only have each other to rely on for that. So that's always been my hope and strength over 20 years, and it's, it's what's kept me going, um, just the support from, from people like yourself and, and alternative media and, and others. So I think this is an, a time for all of us to become all the more activated when we see things like this happening. Um, now, uh, what are... Um, uh, say, 
uh, if people really would like to become in, involved, uh, we're, we're just at, at the beginning of, of June now. What do you suggest that, that they do? Well, you know, in, for listeners in, in Canada, you can definitely help organize one of these local forums that will be happening in at least three places in Canada, Vancouver, Toronto, and Ottawa, uh, in September and October. Uh, we need venues, we need uh, media coverage, we need people to help out with the documentation and and the recording of the evidence that will be brought forward. So like I say, uh, people can contact me directly at uh, my phone, 250-753-3345. And um, I would, you know, just step forward and, and start helping the process because this is the only way it will happen. Right. And, and again, they're... they're um uh, people can 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 keep uh, updated uh, with the with the website here at uh, itccs.org. Um, are there any final thoughts that that you would like to leave leave with the leave with the listeners? Well, you know, I find that because of the, the perilous times we live in, it's important for all of us to find a unity crossing over the different issues and many different things that concern us and, and campaigns we're involved in and find the common ground. When I was in Europe speaking to different people, uh, what was encouraging was every time I went back to a place a second time, the numbers would be double or triple what they were before. And the reason, I believe, is because what I keep saying to people is there's three common issues that need to unite us across all boundaries. Our children, the fate of the earth, and our rights and sovereignty as human as men and women. And all of those are under attack, and so we have to unite on those three, and that's what we're we're saying again and again in our tribunal. This tribunal is a, a springboard to take further political action, to unite us across boundaries and borders, and and really confront these genocidal institutions that are destroying our planet and our children and our rights. So I would say, yes, come together, and uh, itccs.org is certainly a good resource to start with. I'd say in Canada as well, just um, sharing the information on our website, hiddenfromhistory.org, and hiddennolonger.com, where a lot of the evidence about the genocide in the boarding schools is, is recorded. Um, besides that, Alfred, I would just say that we have to continue to uh, not be afraid and continue to put the truth out because it, it's really our defense, and especially in, in the memory of the, all of these children who have died and who continue to suffer. That's really why, why I do a lot of what I do. Oh, well, thank you. And, and so, so uh, we'd like to invite you back as the preparations for the tribunal go forward and, and also during the tribunal itself. We would like to cover the proceedings and what sort of reports will be coming out from the tribunal. We're going to be issuing a, uh, a final report uh, which uh, will contain sections from the different countries and, and issues. And that report will certainly be out by Christmas. The report will, we hope will be the basis to get courts in other countries to start bringing charges against these heads of state and others responsible for child trafficking and these other crimes against the earth and, and our people. And so people can be, play a real role in the production of that report and what's going to be in it. And that's one of the, the jobs that very much need to be done. And, and I thank you, Alfred, for, for offering to help in that way. I'll certainly take you up on that. Good enough, then. Uh, well, great. Um, so, so we look forward to, to, to hearing updates. And um, uh, people can uh, keep in touch with the work of the tribunal at itccs.org. And we've been with Reverend Kevin Annette. Uh, what exactly is your title with the with the I'm, tribunal, Kevin? I'm the interim secretary of the of the ITCCS. Excellent. Very good. Well, thank you very much for for being with us, Kevin. Thank you, Robert. Good enough, then.